Well, thank you, Emily and Chelsea, and good morning and welcome to Cross Lutheran Church for this fourth Sunday in Advent. I'm Pastor Lori, and Emily, Chelsea, and I are glad that you are worshiping with us. If you're visiting, welcome. We're glad that you joined us this morning as well. We thank Dwayne Goodnecht and Lena March for serving as our readers today. The fourth Sunday of Advent is about the Annunciation. This is the visit of the angel Gabriel to tell Mary that she would become the mother of God's own son. At first, Mary did not believe it was possible, but then she committed herself to serving, to serving God as his mother, if that was what God was calling her to do. Roman Catholic Christians use this passage as the basis for their prayer called the Hail Mary. The color for our Advent is blue. Blue is the color for our hope in the Lord who loves us all. Uh, just a reminder that our midweek Advent theme centers around living this season of the church year, and we're doing that intentionally with hope, peace, joy, and love. Those daily intentions also have a scripture verse, and they have been included in each midweek bulletin, which could also be used as a daily devotion. Please continue to join us for the last midweek Wednesday worship and also to participate in those final weekly practices as we have explored what it means to wait with hope and peace and joy. Our final midweek will focus on love. And I just also would like to say, if you haven't tuned in to the Cross Christmas pageant, please make time to do so. Hope is born, a light in the darkness is just, in a word, excellent. And it manages to bring this holy kind of energy to that familiar Christmas story in these unfamiliar times. It's awesome. And so thanks again to all of you who took part in that. We also know that this Christmas is shaping up to be like none other that we've experienced and so will our Christmas service this year. So we will offer one service for December 24th and 25th which you can view beginning on Christmas Eve. Remember, too, that your offering can be sent to the church office, and we thank you ahead of time for that. And now we'll just spend a moment or two preparing our hearts and our minds for worship.
We begin our service with a confession and forgiveness in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our opening hymn, Savior of the Nations Come, in the ELW number 263. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy, for the peace of the whole world, for 
pray together the prayer of the day, let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. With your abundant grace and might, free us from the sin that would obstruct your mercy, that willingly we may bear your redeeming love to all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue our service with the readings. The first lesson for the fourth Sunday of Advent is from Second Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 11 and verse 16. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved among, about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Here ends the first lesson.
second lesson is from Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. Now to God who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever amen the word of the lord The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the first chapter. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. In a year that has just been fraught with trouble and chaos and fear and anxiety, here's some words from Debbie Thomas, who is a pastor, whose commentary I read while preparing this almost too familiar Advent text. She writes her thoughts when she's musing about how Gabriel says hello to Mary as greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Here's what she says. God's favor is not the thing I'd like to believe it is. It's not the God of the New Testament who equates divine favor with wealth or health or comfort or ease. That's just me getting it wrong. Mary's favored status led her straight from scandal to danger to the trauma of her son's crucifixion. God's call required her to be profoundly countercultural, to trust an inner vision that flew in the face of everything her community expected of her. As the years passed and her son's enemies multiplied, Mary's yes demanded a degree of courage that makes me tremble as a mother. And then she closes with this Let's not deceive ourselves. It is no benign thing to be favored of God. And as I read those, I thought, you know, those are really profound words. 
And we read that these words do confound Mary, who then asks Gabriel how all he is telling her can be. And Gabriel answers her in verse 35, saying, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the concept of this mysterious miracle is really reminiscent of the Holy Spirit hovering or moving over the waters in Genesis 1 Two, because the Holy Spirit shadowed over, the wall, over those waters before the beginning of time, and God created life in those waters, too. And so now the Holy Spirit will now shadow over Mary and create life in her. So what's the bigger miracle? The Spirit over the waters in Genesis where God created life? or the spirit over the womb of Mary, creating life? And those are a couple of questions that I think are good ones for us to ponder and also to perplex over. But God has already moved on, right, with a plan and a purpose for creation for Mary and for you and for me. One translation of the Bible says that Mary was a handmaiden, And the word handmaiden really means that Mary was a servant because the Greek word that's used is doulos, and it's often used in the Bible for uh, a servant or a slave. Mary was a servant girl. She was a slave. She was someone else's property. And so that also reveals to me the potential of the liberation that Christ came to offer each and every one of us and the freedom that that might bring even to the meek and to the lowly, those like Mary, whom God chooses to bring God's son into the world. And the truth of it is that God's still choosing people today, right? Common and ordinary people like you and like me to bring Christ, to deliver Christ and his good news into the world. God chooses. God chooses you and me. And God has chosen our lives to live out God's mission in the world. And God chooses us because God is good and God is gracious, and sees even in us the possibility of what we might be able to accomplish with God's help. So God has chosen us as disciples, called to carry Jesus Christ out into the world. Obviously, not in our wombs or our uterus. Half the population isn't equipped to do that anyway, right? But we're rather called to carry Jesus in our hearts and in our spirits as bearers of truth, bearers of the truth that Jesus, Emmanuel, is God with us, and it's God's gift within us to share to a world that is still greatly in need of a Savior. And so we do that. We bear Christ's love to accomplish good works of love on Christ's behalf as a result of what God has done and continues to do for us. And so we have this common call to mission and ministry together as God's people and also as the church. And so that same spirit that moved over the waters, that same spirit that moved over Mary now moves within us, making each and every one of us pregnant with possibilities on how we might share the good news of the gospel. So a question for us might be, are we equipped? Are we equipped to do that, to respond in what God might be calling us to do? How can this be for us? How can this be? Mary responds to Gabriel as well. And we might say the same thing if we had received an unexpected visit like she did and then how we might be called out of our comfort zones like Mary into some kind of new adventure. Would we have the courage to answer like Mary did? Do we have the courage today to answer that? And what does Gabriel do in our story? The angel does this. He reassures Mary in telling her not to be afraid, telling her God is with you. 
God is with you, and God is going to bring something wonderful from your life. So it appears that Mary's uniqueness is not her perfection, but it is more her willingness to say yes to what certainly must have seemed impossible to her. And so she aligns herself with God's will. And those miracles occur, right? With God, nothing is impossible. And so what we might deem as impossible may be part of God's deeper reality breaking forth in our own lives if we're willing to say yes. And, you know, as I was thinking a little bit outside the box, um, it's worth a wonder, isn't it? Or maybe even worth a moment of pondering as to how many young girls might have said no before God came to Mary. But that really is unimportant, I guess, because it's Mary who said yes, right? And the miracle of God's Son brought into the world will become God incarnate, word incarnate, born in a manger, to make a difference then in how the universe itself, really how all of creation will then play out. And so when we think about that miracle, there are still miracles going on today, right? Even today, when it appears sometimes that not much of anything is going well or right. Here's a couple of miracles that I thought about. The first is this vaccine that's being delivered in record time, but still with solid research and proper testing and safe procedure. And the other miracle in regard to that is the frontline workers who continue to show up and to treat others with courage and and confidence in what is already a stretched medical community and that they'll be up there in the front lines to receive the vaccine too. And we know that people are still dying from this virus, but people are recovering too. And maybe by the time I finish preaching this sermon, the miracle of a sharply divided Congress will have come together to provide help for those who are so affected by the results of this pandemic. Those who are now jobless or unemployed in one way or another, small businesses, and really the economy in general, by saying yes, finally, to an agreement as well as yes to God's call to help the people that are so much in need as a result of what's happened. Because in saying yes to God's call, whatever that might be for each and every one of us, whatever that might be, as a result of it, the world is transformed in one way or another. And it can always have the potential to stem the growing distance that there is between the rich and the poor, the unjust distribution of the world's resources, and the destruction of the earth and its ecosystems. There's always miracles to be had. Mary's miracle may appear impossible to some of us, And maybe for some of us, it's even a story that no longer bears any meaning or has any kind of truth to it. And at first glance, Christmas really can't change our greed or our self-interest, maybe, or our neglect of the, uh, the vulnerable or the marginalized. Yet we still hear from Gabriel that with God, nothing, nothing is impossible. And that ought to give us hope. You know, the Holy Spirit opened Mary's heart to the power of God's miracles. And the Holy Spirit is always inviting our hearts to be open to whatever God might have in mind for us, too. And how different, how different Mary's experience might have been if Gabriel had stuck around to erase her doubts, and to silence her critics. But no, we know that. Gabriel left, leaving the ongoing work of discernment and discipleship to Mary alone. Her yes didn't signal the end of the mystery. Really, the mystery for her had just begun. But at the same time, we still need to remember Gabriel's words in our story of Mary 
Theotokos, that's what she's called, the mother of God, as to what Gabriel says to her as she was perplexed and pondering all this. What does he say? He says this, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Gabriel did not say it three times, but I did, because I think as I was, you know, thinking about this sermon, sometimes uh, it's good for all of us to hear it more than once if you have sometimes uh, disbelieving or head or heart like I do. Because the truth of it is, we have no way of knowing what Mary knew. Maybe, maybe she knew just enough, just enough to get started and that the work of bearing God into the world involved discovery. Maybe it involved a mother's intuition. I'm sure it did, and courage, as well as physical and spiritual focus and energy, not to mention prayer, faith, and trust that God would provide along with God's favor as Gabriel's words to her began to sink in. And the result of that, the result of Mary whispering yes into God's heart as she pondered God's request of her in her own heart, it changed the world. It changed the world. And our prayers and our trust and our faith and our spiritual energy and focus, if we apply that when we answer God's call, this too has the potential to do the same. It can, it does change the world, and it makes a difference because truly nothing is impossible with God. Even in this year that has been fraught with trouble and chaos and fear and anxiety, at the same time, we have also seen so many stories and acts of kindness and courage, so many miracles, large and small, throughout 2020, that it really does prove that we can and we do make a difference. And through Jesus Christ, the good news for us is that we have all found favor with God. And we can share and pass along that favor to others. Amen. We sing our hymn of the day. The angel Gabriel from heaven came in the ELW number 265.
the whole church we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, we pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Gracious God, we pray for your church at large and for all servants of the good news of your gospel, that all might proclaim Emmanuel, God with us, present today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your creation. Help us protect and use with care all you have made. Protect those in the way of storms and provide rescue efforts and workers with the strength they need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our neighbors of other denominations and faiths. Inspire the faith of their people. Cultivate understanding among us and strengthen us in love and service to our community. Watch over leaders of all nations, those who advocate for peace and justice and on behalf of others, the stranger and the refugee, the least and the lost, the poor and the hungry, those preparing to give birth, the sick and the dying. Especially we pray today for Peter, Nancy, Tom, Ron, Kareen, Greg, Dottie, Richard, Harry, Marv, Sharon, Mark, Sherry, Marilyn, and Maria, as well as those we now name aloud or in our hearts before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray you sustain all workers and business owners who suffer loss of livelihood due to shutdowns, quarantines, closed borders, and other restrictions from the pandemic. Protect and guard all those who must travel. Bless the work of advocates, community organizers, and food pantries serving those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray you open our eyes to recognize your image and likeness in our neighbor. Enable us to see racism and free us to challenge and uproot it from our society, our world, and ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who have died, remembering 300,000 deaths due to the coronavirus, as well as the life of Don Neuenfeld. Bev Hively, Bridget Deeg, Dorothy Miller, Kevin Anderson, Phyllis Rigwalski, Pat Hagen, Daryl Anderson, Carol Lindquist, Richard Agnew, David Larson, Ellie Wisman, and Bruce Bergren. Comfort their loved ones in their despair. Heal our world and our bodies and strengthen our hearts and minds. And in the midst of turmoil, give us hope and peace. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
And then after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the gifts of God's forgiveness and grace. The body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. O God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our sending hymn, The Canticle of the Turning, in the ELW number 723.
go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.